to be this morning. So uh, Matthew 6, beginning in verse 9, or it's page 978 in the Church Bible. Uh, let's pray this together. Uh, you, do, you can notice there, just as we begin, uh, it doesn't say me and my and I, it says our. It is a, it is a prayer for all of God's people and um, one that we can pray together. So let's say this together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven now our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Let's ask God's blessing on our meeting. Our Father, we thank you that you love us, care for us, and that we can come to you in Jesus' name. And we pray that you would give us the strength we need this morning. We pray that you would be glorified in us. Help us in our worship. Help us to hear your word. We pray that you would build us up and strengthen our faith, that you might be glorified. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to listen to a hymn sung through. It's 556. 556. Five, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. It's a, a longer hymn, seven verses. I uh, just encourage you to enjoy hearing these words sung and uh, hum along softly to yourself if you'd like and meditate on the words.
really is a, a glorious thing to be among people who believe the gospel with all their hearts and just want to sing. And um, maybe you felt that way this morning as you listened to it. Uh, go home and sing it. Just sing your head off and um, don't worry about uh, whether you quite sound like as nicely as you'd like to sound or just go and sing. All right, we're going to uh, read scripture together now and uh, return to this passage once again. It's Matthew 16. We've just settled into this passage the last few weeks. In the Church Bible, it's page 991. And we'll, we'll read uh, verses 13 to 23 again. So page 991 in the Church Bible, Matthew 16. And we'll read verses 13 down to verse 23. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go, on, that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. This is God's word. We're used to often now hearing that um, at such and such a time, uh, there will be special announcements made by the government, uh, whether it has to do with new measures taken to combat the spread of coronavirus or new rules that are going to be instituted for that purpose. Um, we're accustomed to this now. Uh, pay attention and listen in and watch and hear what's happening. Uh, just imagine that it is announced uh, today that there will be a special announcement by the Prime Minister on Monday afternoon regarding developments that will revolutionize our battle with COVID-19. And rumors begin to spread. Uh, the pundits on the various news channels uh, begin to talk about what might this announcement include. And uh, the rumor is that an effective vaccine has finally been found. And so Monday afternoon, Boris Johnson appears behind his podium with the signs in the front, you know, keep your distance and all those things. And he's flanked by a team of scientists and government advisors, all wearing masks and socially distanced, of course. And he gets right to the point. He announces that efforts to find a vaccine for the coronavirus have been discontinued because something even more effective has been found. And he goes on. We have discovered a vaccination for death itself. Can you imagine the sensation that would be created from an announcement like that? Not only have we not only are we 
no longer worried about the coronavirus, but we can actually cure death itself. Well, that's never going to happen. We know that. But Jesus announces here that he will establish something that not even death can destroy. And what Jesus has established and is now building, which not even death can destroy, is the church. And we need to be reminded this morning that even though we feel powerless in our circumstances, uh, who hasn't been frustrated and just kind of sighed in exasperation over the current state of things because of the coronavirus and all that's happening as a result of that, uh, we need to be reminded that Jesus is doing something. That, that this is actually, if you're a Christian, this is the, the, the dominant reality of your life that you are the, the beneficiary, you are actually part of what Jesus is doing, something he said he would do, and he is doing it. And it's something that not even death can destroy. So I want to encourage you this morning to put your confidence in Christ and his plan to build his church. And I want to begin with this question, how can death be conquered. Uh, and I, the reason I'm talking about death being conquered is that uh, we need to understand a phrase here in Matthew 16. Of course, Peter has just uh, confessed his belief that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he does that really speaking for all the other apostles. Peter often played that role of just speaking up when no one else seemed to know what to say. Peter had something to say, and here he is spot on. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, the, the Messiah, is that what that word Christ means? This promised king that the Jews were uh, anticipating and longing for. Jesus is that king, although he is not what they were expecting. And so Peter, or I'm sorry, Jesus responds to Peter's confession. And he, we've looked at these words already. He says, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. We've considered the importance of this, that if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, it is because... God has revealed something to you. He has shown you in your heart uh, the true nature of who Jesus is. And it's not just a matter of intellectual knowledge. It's not just a, a fact that you could spout off uh, because you have this knowledge. It is actually uh, the sense of who Jesus is, the sense of his goodness and glory, just like you can know about the taste of honey, the sweetness of it, but you really don't know anything about it truly until you taste it. Can you really be an expert on the taste of honey if you've never tasted it? Uh, you can know in theory about it, but you have to taste it to really know what it's like. And that's what it's like becoming a Christian. You might have had the basic facts in your head for a long time, but to truly believe on Jesus is more than just knowledge that you agree with. It is uh, embracing Jesus. It's coming to have a true sense of his goodness and glory. And that only happens as the Father reveals it to you, as he shines the light of his glory into your heart. So that's what's happened. That's why Peter can make this confession and Jesus then goes on in a way that somewhat mirrors the confession of Peter. Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And now Jesus says, all right, Peter, I'll tell you who you are now. You are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We're going to take... We're going to go in somewhat reverse order here. That last phrase, the gates of hell, uh, 
you might, if you're looking at the church Bible, you'll see there's a little number two next to the word hell. And down at the bottom of the page, there's a footnote and it says Greek, the gates of Hades. So the word there, if you were just to kind of translate it or transliterate it into English would be Hades. And it's a word that is, uh, has a, a counterpart in the Old Testament, a word that refers to the grave or the realm of the dead. It's a word that would be pronounced Sheol. Maybe you've heard of that word. Maybe you've seen a, a Bible translation that, that, speak, that uses that word. And so when Jesus is speaking of the, the gates of hell, not being able to prevail against the church, the, the gates of hell or the gates of, of death, you could say, are really just symbolic of the power of death itself. And we have a number of Old Testament references that, that speak this way. For example, Psalm 9, verse 13. Be gracious to me, O Lord. See my affliction from those who hate me. O you who lift me up from the gates of death. Speaking of God there, you who lift me up from the gates of death. The gates of death there is death itself. It's speaking of the power of death. In Isaiah 38, you have King Hezekiah who nearly died, but the Lord healed him, brought him back from the edge of the grave. And he uh, has a, a song that he sings in commemoration of that in verse 10 of Isaiah 38. And recounting his experience of almost dying, he says, uh, in, the, in the middle of my days, I must depart. Well, he says, I said this. I said, in the middle of my days, I must depart. I am consigned to the gates of Sheol, or some translations say the grave or death. I am consigned to the gates of Sheol for the rest of my years. He was speaking of his experience of almost dying. And he was in that moment expecting that he was going to go to the gates of Sheol, the gates of the grave. And so here, I think that the, the most prominent idea here is that Jesus is saying that the power of death itself will not prevail against the church. Now, uh, we, sometimes, we sometimes think of in terms of uh, hell having gates for protection against attack, and the church is this, this um, invading army that is, uh, you know, attacking hell, and hell won't be able to withstand the attack of Christ's church. And I think there's some, the, some truth in that, but I don't think that's really exactly what Jesus is, is getting at here. He's saying that nothing will be able to destroy the church, not even our greatest enemy, death. And death is conquered by dying. We've already read Jesus foretelling his own death. How can someone say, I'm going to build something that is indestructible, that not even death can destroy, and then in the next breath go on to say that he himself is going to be crucified and killed? He tells his disciples about this plan. He began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Jesus conquered death by dying because death is the ultimate result, the ultimate penalty for sin. Uh, God warned Adam and Eve in the garden, in the day that you eat that fruit, you will die. And of course, they didn't physically die right away, uh, but they died spiritually. Death came by sin. The Bible tells us. And the, eventually they did die physically as well. And our physical death even is a reminder of the fact that we live in a fallen world, that we are subject to the curse of sin. And yet Jesus came and conquered death. Hebrews 2 tells us, since therefore the children of the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. So the human race since the fall has been under this curse and generation after generation has died. In fact, 
That's one of the most striking things in the, the gene, one of those first genealogies in the book of Genesis. Every single person, it says, he lived so many years, he had sons and daughters, and he died. And the next one, and the next one, and the next one. Yet Jesus came and destroyed death. He destroyed the one who has the power of death, the devil. He rose from the dead. And that's why, as the Apostle Paul in, in 1 Corinthians 15 recounts uh, what it means to believe in the resurrection and the importance of it and how it's, it's tied to Christ's own resurrection. He, he, as he's drawing to a conclusion there, he quotes from the Old Testament. He says, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? And the point is there by asking those questions, it, it doesn't have a victory. It doesn't have a sting. It's lost its sting. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the marvelous thing about your position as a Christian is that none of the most important things you possess can be taken from you. You realize that? You could lose your physical health. You could lose possessions. You could lose your job. But those things in and of themselves are not ultimately important. They're not everlasting. Death cannot take those things from you. This is one of the sad realities in our culture is that so, most people just, they, they really do think in their spiritual blindness, that death is the end of existence. And when they, they, they think that when they die, um, that's the end of anything good. That's the loss of anything real. Uh, loved ones look on and they, they talk about the person in the past tense and they, they just assume that this person no longer exists. And so, and since there's nothing we can do about death in the end, it's something that people try to ignore. They don't want to talk about it. They just want to focus on the life they have right now. And they want to fill it with as much enjoyment and pleasure and satisfaction as they can get before death takes it all away. And one Part of this sad reality is that none of those things that they think are going to fill their life with pleasure and satisfaction, in the end, none of those things really deliver. It's all just fleeting and, and temporary. And so this is what leads many people into addiction and, and excessive pursuit of pleasure because the first round didn't really take. Or after a while, it just doesn't do anything for them. So they have to move on to something even grander, even more extreme. And it's the folly of our, of our sin-cursed world that people are just on this never-ending pursuit. If I could just get a little bit nicer clothing or a little bit nicer house or a little bit better holiday or a nicer car, or if I could get a better body or a, a more attractive partner, then then finally, my life will be what I've been hoping it will be. And they might even achieve some of those things. They might even get some of those things. And then they realize, you know what? This is not it. This is not going to fill me. This is not going to satisfy me. And so they look for something else. Move on to the next thing. Until they die. And it's all gone. Jesus said... I will build my church, and not even death can destroy it. My friend, if you are a believer, don't for a moment fall into the deception of thinking that something outside of Christ and his work in your life is going to satisfy you. It's temporary. It's ineffective. 
but what Christ has done will last forever. Not even the gates of hell will prevail against the church. You trust in a risen Savior who conquered death for you, so that though you probably someday will die unless the Lord returns first, that is not the end for you. That is not the end for you. You have eternal life, and you can look forward to a resurrection to glory. Well, there's another question in this text that we need to address. How can death be conquered? That's where we started. Secondly, how is Peter the rock on which the church is built? What is Jesus saying to Peter here? Um, Just a couple things to understand about the wording. First of all, the word for uh, rock is uh, Petra in in the, the original Greek. And so... Jesus is calling Peter Petros here. He's saying, you are Petros and you are the Petra. And uh, he's making a play on words there. He's calling Peter the rock. Uh, his original name was Simon. And when, Peter, when Jesus first met Simon, he said, you're going to be called Peter. He's also known as Cephas, which is uh, the la- from the language of Aramaic, which is actually the language Peter, Jesus and his disciples would have spoken. And Cephas means rock. So Peter or Jesus is saying to Peter, you are the rock. It's not something else that's the rock. He's not saying here the confession that Peter made is the rock. Uh, He's not pointing at himself as he's talking to Peter and saying that he is the rock. Some people have suggested that. He's, He's saying here that Peter is the rock. And so the question is, how is it that Peter is the rock on which the church is built? Of course, the Roman Catholic Church is has uh, built something else on this verse, uh, a whole false doctrine about the place of Peter and his role. And he is not, Jesus is not here giving Peter the role of Pope, uh, but he is telling Peter that he is the rock on which the church is going to be built. And I want to explain what he means by that. First of all, Peter is the rock as a representative Right As speaker for the apostles, Peter represents the other apostles who share in this confession, and they all will play a role as part of the foundation of the church. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20 tells us, tells us that the church, which in Ephesians 2 is called the household of God, is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ being the chief cornerstone. So, Peter is the rock, but he is uh, partly the rock as representative of the other apostles. He's not solely the foundation of the church or anything like that. So when Christ calls him the rock, he's partly calling him the rock because he is representative of all of them, all of the apostles who will be part of the foundation of the church. Peter is also the rock as not just as a representative, but as the leader. And the reality is that Peter plays a central role in the establishment of the New Testament church. Uh, You could find this out for yourself in the book of Acts. If you were to read through the book of Acts in the first 15 chapters or so, Peter doesn't appear in every chapter, but at virtually every key moment in the development and growth of the church, Peter is at the center of it. Uh, He presided over the selection of the 12th apostle to replace Judas in Acts chapter 1. That was Peter's leadership there. In Jerusalem at Pentecost, it's Peter who stands up and explains what is happening and calls the crowds to repentance and baptism. And 3,000 were added to the church in one day in Acts chapter 2. In Samaria, Philip takes the gospel to Samaria So the next step of gospel spreading outside of Jerusalem. But once people begin to believe the gospel, Peter and John go to Samaria. And they go specifically to pray for the new believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 8. And of course, Jesus said that they would be his witnesses, not only in Jerusalem, but in Judea and Samaria, the surrounding area. 
and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so then uh, after Samaria, uh, the gospel then goes uh, to the Gentiles. You could think of that as the uttermost parts of the earth. And in Acts chapter 10, it's Peter who is directed by a vision to go and preach the gospel to the household of Cornelius the centurion, who was a Gentile. And while he's there, he preaches the gospel and the Holy Spirit falls on those present and they are baptized. And you'll just note that uh, in each case, when a new people group is reached with the gospel, the Holy Spirit doesn't come on those people until one of the apostles comes and prays for them to receive the Holy Spirit because the apostles were uh, the foundation of the church. Uh, we don't do that today because the era of the apostles is over. The Holy Spirit indwells someone when they are converted, when they come to believe in Jesus Christ, and there's no need of an apostle to come and lay hands on them or anything like that. But that did happen in the early stages of the church. And when Peter recounted these events to the church in Jerusalem, they concluded that God was giving to the Gentiles the same gift of the Spirit that had been given to them, and that he had granted the Gentiles repentance that leads to life. But that, that next step of the church and of the spread of the gospel took place under Peter's leadership. So clearly in the early stages of the growth of the church, Peter is the one uh, leading a great deal of it. But so he's the rock as a representative. He's the rock as a leader. But thirdly, he's not a leader without equals. All right, the 12 acted as a group in leading the church to select the first deacons in Acts chapter 6. And in Acts 11, after Peter took the gospel to the Gentiles, he was called to account by the church in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 11. It wasn't that he uh, had authority over all of them. They called him to account. They wanted, him to, they wanted to know what had happened, and they, he had to demonstrate to them that this was of God. And in Acts chapter 15, Peter played a leading role in the Jerusalem council where they were trying to decide questions about how the Gentiles would be included in the church and whether they should be expected to live as Jews once they became Christians. Uh, Peter played a leading role in that council, but he did not have authority over it. And it was actually James who settled the matter in Acts chapter 15. So he's not a leader without equals and he's not an infallible leader. All right, we've seen here, Peter confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God, but that was the only thing he got right. And when he protested about Jesus dying, Jesus called him Satan and called him a stumbling block. So Peter was not infallible. And later on, Paul, the apostle, actually had to oppose Peter to his face publicly because Peter was acting in a way that was contrary to the gospel. You can read about that in Galatians 2. And Peter accepted this correction. So Peter is not a pope here. Uh, there really was no pope for the first several hundred years of the church. And of course, when all that, that Roman system came into place, it was an error. It was a mistake. It shouldn't have happened. So Peter is the rock on which the church is built in the sense that he played a leadership role. He was representative of the apostles in their leadership role, but he was not without equals and he was not an infallible leader. So Jesus was saying, Peter is the rock and the church will be built on him, his leadership. But thirdly, I want to end with this. The unconquerable church is built by the gospel. Right? The, the church uh, cannot be destroyed by death. It was given leadership by the apostles. But this is what is most applicable to us today. It, it is built by the gospel. We're not going to get into what verse 19 means this morning about the keys of the kingdom and uh, what things that are being loosed and things that are being bound but that has to do with entrance to the kingdom being determined by faith in the gospel. Peter wasn't given the power to say who was going to heaven and who wasn't, but the church, Peter and the apostles, and by extension the church was given 
the thing that does admit entrance to heaven, the thing that does admit entrance into God's kingdom, and that is the gospel. And so when Jesus says, I will build my church, of course, he's not talking about a building. He's not talking about a church building, as we often use the term today. You say, I'm going to church, and among other things, you might mean, well, I'm going to the building where we all meet. Jesus wasn't talking about a building. He was talking about a community of believers in the gospel. The word church uh, is, it comes from a word that ordinarily just meant assembly, an assembly of people, a, a gathering of people. And it actually is the, word, is the word that was used commonly in the Old Testament of Israel. If you read stories uh, in Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and references to Israel in the past, and it will often call them the congregation in the wilderness or the assembly. It was often used to speak of the Israelites as they gathered uh, for worship. And Jesus uses that word to speak of this new community of believers in the gospel. You're not born into the church. You come into the church through faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, I will build this. I will build this family or this household or this community, this church of believers. It's built by the gospel. If you are a Christian, you are part of what Jesus is doing. He says, I will build it, and he is building it. And as the gospel spreads, as more and more people come to faith in Jesus Christ, that work is ongoing. It is the only thing on earth that will not be destroyed by death. If you've come to faith in Jesus Christ, you are part of this body. You are part of one another as Christians. And you have a role to play as Christ builds his church. God works through his people to spread the gospel, to build one another up, to encourage one another towards holiness and faithfulness to Jesus Christ. You may not know where your life is headed in terms of career prospects or what's going on in your family or even what's going on in your health. But if you are part of the church, you are part of something that will last. You are part of something that is being built by Jesus Christ, something that is inhabited by the Holy Spirit, as we learn elsewhere in the New Testament. Give thanks and be at rest in the fact that Christ is doing this. And he's doing this in your life. He has revealed himself to you and put you in this community of believers that he is building, against which not even death will be victorious. It's an amazing privilege to be part of Christ's church, to be part of what he is doing. And not even death can destroy that. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for Jesus, that he died and that he rose from the dead. And Lord, we pray, we pray that we might be a part of this work he is doing to build his church. Lord, help us to be faithful, each one of us, with the role you've given us to play in that. Help us not to be hopeless or directionless since we've been put into your church, made a part of Christ's people. We pray that you would be glorified in our church. We pray for all the local churches, Lord, particularly in Wales right now, that you would help us Help us to be faithful to our Savior. Help us to be led by him. We pray that we would know his blessing and his help. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.